Good morning. So we saw in that poll that people are mostly curious but need to know more about AI. And then the second biggest vote was for optimistic and energized. I'm imagining that makes you both feel pretty good given your line of work. Definitely. Absolutely. Great. So, Colin, I want to start with you. You've talked about being interested in humble AI. Mm -hmm. What on earth does that mean? So, so let me take a step back. I come from um, GE, and so in GE, what we do is we build things like jet engines and steam turbines and gas turbines. So when you have assets that are long-lived, these assets last 40 years, 30 years, and actually deliver significant value with safety constraints, you can find a tendency for people there to say, let's not use anything that disturbs a deterministic understanding. Those planes must land safely, these things must generate electricity. So when we talk about humble AI, and when we try to introduce AI, this is the notion that the AI has an area of competency. And in that area of competency, what I want you to do is to trust it. Outside the area of competency, it can go back to using regular deterministic algorithms. So let me give you an example. So there's a wind turbine. A wind turbine takes the force of the wind, generates electricity. Within certain wind speeds, you know, say for instance, we get the right data, and between 20 and 40 miles an hour, we can generate more electricity. Well, if we do that and we do that well, the engineers say, okay, within that wind speed, that's an area of competency, because mm -hmm. you have the data and proven it, I'll let you use it. Above 40 miles an hour, what you do is you revert back to the designs that we've been using for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the AI has an area of competency. Inside that area of competency, it knows what it knows. Then outside of it, this is why we call it humble, you know your area of competency and outside of it we learn. It's called active learning. So once you get outside of 40 miles an hour, what happens then is we run a design of experiments. We get enough data between 40 and 50 miles an hour, and when we think we have the right AI techniques, then we in extend the competency. So this is the notion of humble AI, knowing your area of competency, mm -hmm. executing within that area, and when you're outside of that area, doing active learning. It does two things. One, it, it inspires people to trust the AI within that zone. Mm -hmm. People want to use it. It doesn't have to be 100% right across every range. Once you use it, now people get the notion of, you know, I can adopt it and then I can control it. I can get it more data. It learns a little bit better. So now the ROI, the return on investment becomes easier. Now it becomes easier for people to adopt it. So that's the notion of humble AI. Right. So when you said trust, that was the thing that I was thinking the entire time you were talking about that kind of window of competency. And I imagine for a lot of people, that trust is really hard, especially when you go outside of the people who are building and working with these algorithms every day. How can that trust be engendered so that window of competency grows over time? Uh, we, the way it's done is a certain di design of experiments. So what we do is we start off by saying we have a, a baseline. There is one turbine we have here that actually is going to be run and there's one next to it. And so we begin to evaluate on that baseline. If I did use these algorithms, how much better could I actually perform while being safe? And so there's a design of experiments that's laid out that begins to get trust. And the trust comes in two ways. One is the notion that you actually can get better performance. And then the next is the notion of causality. You've got to be able to describe why you think you're getting better performance. Is it because of the pitch? Is it because of the fact that you constrain the speed in a certain way? So the AI techniques we use are based on this thing called a digital twin. It combines physical and digital information. Mm -hmm. And because you've combined the two, I can tell you the relationship between the physical and the digital. So I can say when I'm using this data, I'm affecting this bearings, I'm affecting these pitches, I'm affecting the speed, I'm affecting the generation of electricity. So it's a combination of doing the right experiments where you have a baseline and a balance to see the value, and then being able to explain here's why you're getting the benefit. And that together gets the trust over periods of time. Yeah. Then they'll put it through a variety of different experiments and they'll perturb the system and see if the expected results show up and the expected understanding. So that's part of the journey that you go on together. Yeah. I, I would agree with that completely. Um, so first of all, thank you for being here. What an honor to be here with such a great crowd and a set of panelists as well. So, um, you know, when it comes to trust, if you look at the data of how AI is being adopted, it goes back to what 
Colin was saying in terms of AI being humble. Um, AI is not a thing. I mean, we think of it as a thing, but if you look at what it means to have productive, usable artificial intelligence, it needs to be included in the processes that people have in their most essential kind of workloads, their most essential applications, very similar to what Colin was talking about. And so this means that you need a way to be able to establish trust in the outcomes that the, the AI is, is delivering for you. This means that you need to have explainable, trustworthy, bias-free decisions in that AI. And therefore, till you establish that trust, you will always have an augmented set of capabilities where augmented intelligence is extremely important. So this notion of trust of being able to say, can I explain how AI came to a decision, how a decision was actually made and all the factors that went into it, and when there is bias in the AI that actually is occurring in context of that application, can I detect it? And can I actually mitigate that bias? Meaning, can I remove the bias if it's actually necessary? Those are the things that become extremely essential from AI being adopted in the mainstream to it not being adopted. You know, we like to say that AI is moving from random acts of digital to mainstream right now. And to be able to achieve that, this notion of explainability and trust is absolutely essential. Patricia, I want you to go back to that idea of bias in AI. I think a lot of people, at least when they're first learning about this, think, well, this is the answer to bias. This is going to be the thing that helps weed this out. Can you talk a little bit more about how bias can be encoded into AI and how we think about getting it out? Yeah, I mean, if you think about artificial intelligence, it's only as good as the data that you train it on. And if you look at the data that exist today in our systems, whether they be enterprise systems, whether they be systems that exist out in social, all data that exists today has some sort of bias in it. If you think about, for example, one of the example use cases we give in financial services is the past 50 years of data of who gets a loan and who doesn't get a loan is biased in nature. Given the same attributes, more men will get loans than females will. That's a biased set of data. But when you train AI on that, you want to be able to detect that bias and you want to be able to mitigate it to say, you know, we have a bias on gender in this particular case, and we want to be able to remove that bias such that the algorithm itself is not biased on that feature. Yeah. Colin, how are you thinking about that? Gee. No, I, I think what, what Ritika said was excellent. Um, understanding the bias, but in our world, the bias has two dimensions to it. So one bias is if I design that wind turbine, and I took the data during summertime, then that model works well in summer. However, in winter, it's not the same because the wind conditions are different, temperatures different and everything else. So there's a bias there that you've got to account for. The other thing we do that's a little bit different though is that sometimes there's an advantage in the bias. So if you have a wind farm, the position of the wind turbine, you may have this wind turbine here that's hitting, that's getting the full, full brunt of the wind and one next to it. It's called a wake effect. So when the wind hits here, if that turbine is spinning, it alters the wind that comes to the others. This turbine now has a bias because it's in front. Hmm. Can I use that bias in order to get the right wake effect to make this turbine run better? Yeah. So in that case, what I do is I use the bias I have because of placement to inherently give myself something better. So the bias has to work both ways for us. We, we worry about the fact that the data is biased from winter to, to summer and we actually use the bias to give us uh, you know, an effect, something that, that's better. So again, it's all understanding the bias and understanding what you want to get from it. Yeah. How focused do you think the industry is as a whole on thinking through this bias issue? I think it's extremely prevalent. It is, it is the um, thing that will make organizations adopt AI at scale or not. And if you look at most organizations, they are instituting um, types of programs to be able to make ethics of AI and bias at the forefront of how they're actually implementing these technologies. We do so within our organization and working with many others, they're establishing those same kind of programs to, to be able to implement in their, in their organizations. So I think it's important from the sense of 
you know, not all bias, as, as Colin po pointed out, is um, bad, as the example that he gave, but you need to be able to establish rules to determine how you want to be able to use the artificial intelligence and the data in ways that are ethical and pervasive across society and for the organizations themselves. Yeah. I'm wondering, in the charge to make AI mainstream, what do you think the next five to 10 years of that looks like? My personal um, belief in what we have within IBM and our organization is that we'll see a couple of different things come in the forefront. So um, for artificial intelligence, I think one of the main things that we'll see um, in the future is the progression of being able to have explainability in AI, which we already see techniques today, but they will become a lot more mainstream, a lot more prevalent in a lot of organizations. One is, as we talked about, the bias detection and mitigation of that. But the third thing that we see, which um, you know, I think some people are a little bit perplexed by is, you know, I think there'll be a lot of automation of AI. I want you to think about a lot of the major technologies that have existed in the world and when they've come about, when there's such demand for these types of skills. And if you look at the definition of artificial intelligence being a intersection of mathematical computer statistics, programming, and knowledge, and you take all of those things and see what can be automated, the automation of the math and the programming pieces are things that naturally attribute themselves to being automated. Not necessarily the knowledge components because mm -hmm. you can't, you need that data, you need that expertise. So this third thing that you will see in the next five to 10 years, in fact, we're already starting to see it, but not adopted at scale, is this concept of automation of AI. So AI itself, will be automated by being able to have, as long as you have the data, we'll automate the artificial intelligence for you. And then we will be able to now put those into production environments by being able to give you complete trust and transparency in how that AI is executing and how that AI is performing in production. When you say the word automation, my mind automatically goes to jobs. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear out there about how automation um, is going to affect work. You've said before that you think that AI and automation will touch every single job. What do you think it'll look like? So the discussion we had in the back room is, I personally believe artificial intelligence will, um, will impact 100% of jobs. If you think about any knowledge worker today, whether you think about professionals who deal with large amounts of data, whether you're in the legal profession and a lawyer, whether you're a medical professional um, and deal with multiple different types of data that you need to know to be at the top of your game, whether you're an engineer, all of these types of jobs are gonna be able to use the vast amounts of data out there and to be able to use um, technologies like artificial intelligence to provide that data at your fingertips. If you look at other types of jobs where you have um, labor intensive jobs, those kind of jobs will also be automated over time. Um, it's, and and, and our, my belief is that we will, not, we, we will not decrease the number of jobs out there because of artificial intelligence, but we will need to reskill our workforce uh, a lot more to be able to handle what artificial intelligence will have. The average lifespan now of, of the skills that are necessary to do, the job, to do jobs is three to five years. Just think about that for a moment. Three to five years, that's a really short span of time. So even we as professionals needs to constantly be reskilling what it means to be able to do our jobs. And I think, um, you know, when I think about this, I have a nine-year-old daughter and uh, she sees me doing a lot of stuff with data and AI and Watson. And, you know, she asked me a couple of months ago, Mom, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up? And as I'm taking a look at all the different things that exist out there and how the technology cycles are rapidly changing, the real answer I had to give her is, your job hasn't been invented yet. And so I think the biggest advice I could give people is, you know, you need to be curious learners because your job will change and you need to be able to adapt to that change by continually reskilling. Yeah, um, same question for you. I, I think, um, so, so in terms of the jobs, I think there's a transformation happening here that, that we understand, at least in the industrial space. So there's a notion in, in different industries that is a lot of data. Mm -hmm. However, when you truly look at it, there isn't that much data in the spaces we look at in the industrial space. And it, it, it's interesting. 
a lot of the data I can use has to be labeled in some form or fashion, right? We collected data, and this is where the bias comes from, usually during design and in operations when there's a problem. Because most of the data is, is good. Because what I look for in the industrial space is when something happens. When a plane lands and a part has a problem, then the plane can't take off. Mm -hmm. When you turn on those lights and they don't come on, that's an issue. Those things occur fairly infrequently. So the data gathered there is a very little amount. We see a lot of data, but it's not labeled. It's not clean, it's not processed. So there may be a whole new range of jobs for data technicians who do this for us. Mm -hmm. Because in order to learn and to apply the AI, I have to have the data processed in a certain way. I have to get that goal data. That's one dimension. The second dimension is, is AI is, the A is artificial, right? You, you also need some real intelligence, which is how do I change the business model? Mm -hmm. I could figure out ways to actually get an inspection report a lot faster. How do I use that to make money in a different way? How does the value change? If I don't change the value, then that same company that's getting the report faster may not exist later. Because it's not just the speed, it's how do you change value in response to what's happening in an industry. So the skills of the data technician skills that have to show up, the skills of people transforming business value, the also the adoption skills, it's very hard to adopt these things. We've had AI since the 1960s, this is not new. The age of, of invention of AI is there, the age of exploitation of AI is what we go through. AI usually is exploited in a process, right? You've seen um, Google put it in an advertising process, Amazon in a commerce process, we in GE put it in the services process. When you have to insert AI in a services process with humans involved and systems involved, it takes a long time. It's not a simple thing. So again, new type of jobs about how do you insert AI inside that process? What do you do next? So you have AI jobs that are going to be new transformational jobs, and yes, other jobs will go away, but this is a journey, and it's gonna take some time. So I think there is time for us to calibrate, and as Ritika says, retrain people, and get some new skills. Yeah. So I think a lot will be valued. So as more companies are thinking through the process of adoption and advancement of AI in their processes, what are some best practices that mm -hmm. you think they should be paying attention to? I, I always say that there are three things that really impact successful AI implementations and organizations versus not. Um, the most important that I've seen through the thousands of engagements that we've done is culture. And that's probably the hardest one as well. So culture is the first. The second is your processes, because as Colin pointed out, and as I mentioned, AI is not a thing. It's really part of a bigger thing. So you need to understand what that means for the processes that you have. And the third is data, because at the end of the day, your AI is only as good as your data. And to have good AI, you need good IA. That's an information architecture. So culture, process, data, and the most important being culture, because you're changing all of the processes in your organization to be able to infuse that AI. And so what I've seen is that you need to be able to have that support at every level of the organization, because you're doing something that is, is, is not the standard within your organization. Uh I think uh, I love what Ritika said from the strategic level. I think it makes perfect sense. I also work from a, also a tactical level because I'm in shops, I'm in factories, I'm in certain areas, right? So there, there are about, I think, four things I look at. One is there's a basic level of education you've got to provide. And I don't mean education in the formal sense, but most people are confused by what AI is. Mm -hmm. You know, they remember the Terminator, they remember these things, it, it, you know, so it's a whole different mindset about AI. So basic education, YouTube videos, usually the execs, you want to tell them about the value it could provide and a little bit about technology. Whereas the actual people who are implementing, tell them about the technology and some little about value. First thing, you talk about some education. Then you've got to get apprenticeships. Find a few simple projects that prove the value. Very simple things. Take the data, analyze it, the data gives you this. Now, once you have those few wins, the next thing you've got to do is create some heroes. You've got to figure out how you take those people who have won, put them up on a pedestal, show, them, show people that you know, this actually gets you the promotion. This is how the culture changes. Mm -hmm. Then the last thing is you've got to say you have a strategy. 
None of these organizations change unless you say I have an AI strategy and the company is moving with this AI strategy and here are a couple of heroes and here's how you learn. Because now everyone could individually figure out, well, here's the education I need to, to take. Here's how I move up the ladder and compete against the person next to me to get that promotion. Here's what the company would look like in five or six years with AI, so it justifies my putting the effort into it. So those tactical pieces are the pieces that you're actually, with the, complemented by the strategy, that you need to use to actually get people to literally move. Because many people, that, they look at it and they say, well, I've been in this job for years. Why would I do anything else? So you've got to compel them through a personal dynamic to actually go forward. And so that's the journey we're on. So I want to let our audience know that we will be coming to you for questions in just a little bit. If you have questions, you can open up the app that we talked about in the beginning, Slido. Type those into the question section, and we will get to them um, after I ask a few more questions. So Colin, you just mentioned the fact that a lot of people don't know what AI is or know how to define it. I'm wondering what, in your most simplistic form, if we were explaining this to Ritika's daughter's friends, because your daughter probably knows what AI is better than most of us, how, <laughs> how would you explain it in its most simple form? Um, you know, I'm the wrong guy to do that, but let me give it a try, <laughs> right? Um, so. So for, it all depends who you're talking to. So most of the execs I deal with, I talk about it from a value-based perspective. Here's a way to actually increase your productivity or get your revenue, mm -hmm. right? Um, for the technical people, I talk about it from a perspective of productivity for them. Here's a way for you to become more efficient and to remove your time from doing mundane tasks to your time to applying creativity, mm -hmm. right? So I, I tend to come at it from these angles, right? And it is a tool. It is a sequence of mathematical capabilities that allow you to extract information from data that you already have. And that's the, the real crux of it. And the data and the analytics are designed to make you personally better. It's not designed to replace you. Mm -hmm. It's designed to make you better and to deliver value. Then we could go into the details of, you know, supervisors and unsupervised, different five different tribes of AI and all these other details. But once you get that, that it's a value to you, right, and, and it's a form, a, a mathematical, scientific way of doing it, which means it's repeatable, I think the bridge begins to happen. Yeah. How do you I, I think um, very simply, I think of artificial intelligence as being able to train machines to act and think like humans do. So how do you train machines to be able to understand the same way a human would, to learn the same way a human would, to reason the same way a human would, and to then interact the same way a human would? That is very kind of, from my perspective, what that definition of artificial intelligence is. To do it well, as Colin pointed out, you need to be able to have um, an understanding of that data. And so it's not just artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence, because that human has to be there to be able to see how that data is being intersected and being used to be able to remove biases from it to be able to um, have good artificial intelligence. Yeah. So when we started this conversation, you both talked about kind of what your ideal version of this is or what you are thinking about. Um, we talked about humble AI, we talked about making AI mainstream. What do you each think the major hurdles to achieving that are? Colin, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> um, I think it's understandability of the value first. You, you know, it, people do things because it's a value to them personally. Organizations do things because it's a value of them strategically and financially. So if you get the value right, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is the adoption. How do you adopt and who gets displaced? This comes back to the point on cultural, right? Um, that's the biggest next set of steps, right? Now, as you begin to have the organization understand the fact that, like everything else, in terms of to move forward, you have to accept this capability. It becomes, begins to, to get easy. And then you've got to explain to them, how do you accept it? Well, you've you got to start with the education. You've got to do the right projects. You've got to get the right hero you know, um, vernacular going. You have to get the right set of things. So I think you have to get the education on the value and get that value mindset. And then you, got, you have to get the actual set of actions to get the cultural mindset. Mm. That's the progress, I think. 
I think uh, it goes back to the word we talked about before, trust. It's really about having trust in the decisions that AI is making. And then when it comes to being adopted, I want to go back to, because the data that we look at shows over and over again, a culture that promotes um, the changes that are necessary to be able to infuse AI, really adhering to the processes that are necessary to have something that is continuously learning as part of your mainstream applications and workflows and understanding of that data and having the right information architecture. Those three things are the biggest barriers that, that we see, but all of that rooted in trust. Yeah. So let's go to a question from the audience. We have a question from Yael Zhang. If the data from the past and today are biased, how can we ensure that the data gathered from now on is unbiased to improve AI performance in the future? Um, Ritika, let's start with you. Yes, um, so it goes back to that notion of augmented intelligence. You can't guarantee that data that you gather from now is gonna be unbiased. What you need to do is to be able to use capabilities that allow you to detect that bias and then use that augmented portion or, or that human in the loop to be able to make that correction, to be able to understand that that data is biased, make that correction and train that AI in a way where you have de-biasing happening as part of building that artificial intelligence algorithm um, that you have out there. So it really is rooted in, in cleaning that data. And I think yeah. Colin, you, you kind of talked about doing something like that as well with, as you called them, the data engineers that need to label that data, mm -hmm. that human in the loop. I think you're right. I think the other part of this too is the value system, right? So the, the reason I have bias and unbiased is because I have a certain value system. And based upon the values I want to get financially, I can tell if the data is biased or not biased, but also there's a moral system. And so if I lay out the values that say, this is what I want to get financially from the data, this is the value I get. And then there's a set of other moral statements that say, based upon that, I would like to have this moral position. Then with those two value streams, now I can figure out what data do I need to get me unbiased. So unless you have that value stream laid out, then you can't really begin to understand what's, what's unbiased in the future. Then you begin to do the operations of cleaning the data or asking for new data that gets, gets you both things in the value stream. Mm. So I think you have to give that both flavors here. Ritika, I think this next one is for you from yes. Layla Lau. IBM has created an open source fairness toolkit for AI. How has that been received by the community? Extremely positively by the community. We have a large number of um, developers that have actually used that AI fairness toolkit to be able to infuse bias detection um, within their applications. And we've augmented that with um, Watson OpenScale that now provides the ability to be able to detect that bias in your production runtime applications. So not only as you're developing your application, can you now train your application um, using the AI Fairness Toolkit to be able to detect that bias. Now with Watson OpenScale, when you're in a production environment, we will tell you that bias has been detected when decisions are being made at very critical points and then de-bias that in those production environments as well. So. And we have another question from Luke. Do you have any advice for people who want to start using AI in our own companies? Colin. Um, I'll start back with first figuring out what is it you want to achieve. Look at your value stream. If you look at your value stream and say, I make money this way and I'd like to actually get more productivity, you focus on that. Then start again, get the education, do one or two projects, get your heroes, get your strategy. This is the only way to, to truly drive it forward on a consistent basis. Yeah, okay, I want you to answer. Um, I would say just get started somewhere in something that's tractable for you. Um, so I think the difference between what we've seen in projects that are successful or not is the scope that you put out there first. Don't go after things that are untenable, large, multi-month, multi-year projects. Go after something that is bite-sized where you can start showing tangible incremental value because if something doesn't work and you don't understand how to change your processes or how exactly it needs to fit, it's a much more agile way to, to self-correct and course correct over time. All right, and one final question. At IBM and GE, as you look to re training and retooling your workforce, what kinds of leadership development are offered to reskill? 
So from our perspective, there are multiple different tools that we have at our fingertips. Um, one of the things that we have as I lead AI learning for IBM is our own AI Skills Academy, where we have helped um, everybody within our IBM workforce have access to courses and skills on an online platform for them to be able to reskill themselves, not only on artificial intelligence, but other major topics that are important as the skills change is absolutely necessary. And it has been extremely well received. I know my personal organization has all been retrained because you know these new technologies, as we talked about those three to five year cycles, they're gonna impact everyone's jobs. Cool. For us, in addition to doing um educational training, there's a concept of mission teams. We have a lot of good physical scientists, people who are great in aeronautical engineering or thermal engineering. What we do is we put them together with digital scientists and we actually have them do a project. Two things happen. So once that occurs, now the physical scientists could explain the domain to the data scientists, mm -hmm. the, the data scientists benefit. The data scientists explain the techniques mm -hmm. to the physical scientists and so they learn together. And then more importantly than learning and achieving a project, they have a point of contact. They have a good physical guy who knows a good data you know, lady. And so now they have that connection, and so they use each other. Now that team begins to build. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have that apprenticeship piece as well, because the bond and the trust eventually comes from the human saying it's OK. Then it goes to the AI. Yeah. Everyone, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you.